Hey, thank you. Nice. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I am Megan Curran, and I'm acting mayor this evening. Um, Mike is not able to be here. So um, it is the regular meeting of council. It's 7 o'clock on Monday, April 12th. And uh, I need a motion um, for the resolution to hold the public meeting without the public in attendance. Okay. All in, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, that carries. It's gonna be a little slow, guys. <laughs> gonna get there. Um, so the next is the uh, adoption of the agenda. Moved. Is there a second? Councillor Murray, seconded by Councillor Back. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're gonna move into public input. And uh, I believe uh, the first speaker is Mr. Tivan, and you have three minutes to address council. Thank you, uh, acting, acting Mayor. I'm just going to share screen if that's possible. Um, let me know if you can see. We can see it. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Obviously, I'm speaking on the agenda item uh, tonight of a safe supply of opioids. And uh, I wanna start by saying that I uh, support this motion uh, and the reason I do is because we have a crisis on our hands. Um, the crisis is fentanyl uh, and carfentanyl uh, poisoning the drug supply. People are dying. And um, the dismay that I feel is that our federal government is playing politics while vulnerable people are dying. Um, I have my best friend's nephew who's a paramedic and he stopped counting how many times he has resuscitated the same individual in the same night from fentanyl poisoning. Um, I did a graph, a little research, and even though uh, gun control was a major election plank uh, for our current government in the last election, you can see that little bitty number on the left. That is murders in Canada. Uh, 0.38 per 100,000 is the average, according to the Justice Department of Canada. Um, it seems that they think that maybe we're the U.S. where the number is 3.56. Uh, but the amazing part to me as I go through the types of gun deaths in the USA, uh, 3.56 per 100,000 is homicides, 7.35 is suicides, all gun deaths are 12.25. But in B.C. alone in 2020, 33.49 deaths per 100,000. How this is not an election issue and a major plank absolutely defies logic, especially when you compare it to our own gun gun murders, which is was made uh, that and gun control was made an election issue. But uh, what and and what will a safe supply do? Well, in my opinion, it will vastly reduce the number of deaths due to fentanyl and carfentanyl and and even overdoses. It will vastly redu reduce the lucrative illicit drug trade, basically put, put dealers out of business. It will vastly reduce the burden of crime on our city streets and our neighborhoods. But what will it not do? Uh, it won't save lives in the longer term, and I'll get to that in a second. It won't solve the root causes of the problems that cause addiction in the first place, and it won't be sustainable. This is my opinion in one sentence. A safe and free supply of opioids or safer alternatives to opioids to registered addicts is a necessary short-term emergency step that must be followed up by compre a comprehensive plan to save people's lives and restore them to full function. There's a couple of videos that I sent to you council some months ago. Now I didn't hear back from anybody that you had watched them and I get granted an hour and a half uh, for one video and an hour for the other is perhaps a little daunting. But if you care about this issue, I thoroughly encourage you to watch these videos. These are some of the quotes made by the reporter and, and individuals interviewed in that, uh, in that uh, set of videos. This is just from the first one. We're running a concentration camp without barbed wire 
and doing everything up to and including a medical experiment of poisoning people with drugs. That's a Mr. Seattle Teven? police officer who walked away. Mr. Teven, I will. Yes. I um, you are your time is up, but I just wanted to know if you were drawing to a close and we yes, will yes. share this with us. Thank you. I, I definitely am. I think this is a very important issue. Um, the reporter Eric Johnson goes on to say, uh, we constantly refer to it as a homeless crisis, not a drug crisis. How can we ever fix it if we won't even re we won't even name them, uh, name the problem? But the most important one is the bottom. To leave them, meaning drug addicts alone, is a death sentence. Sooner or later, they will die. And I and that doesn't necessarily mean fentanyl. That means from drugs itself. We need to have a program to solve that. I think this is a very key step, and I encourage you to watch these two videos. They're very informative. Thank you, Council. Thank you for your presentation. The next speaker is Michael Renning. <clears throat> so, are you there? How, how about now? Yes, we can hear you now. And so you have three oh. minutes to address council. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, um, my wife and I, and currently my older daughter, um, my younger one's going to UBC in the Okanagan, but we all live at 4048 Dollarton Highway. Um, my spouse Susan's mother lives um, just a short distance down the street at um, uh, Roche Point. And um, uh, we have, uh, have applied for a variance to um, uh, construct a coach house in our front instead of the back. There's no laneway access. And uh, we look forward to its approval uh, as it will help um, keep our family happy all in the same large lot we have. We've been here since 2005 and we've enjoyed the neighborhood a lot. Um, our house is in not the best condition. Um, uh, we're not, uh, uh, how can I say it, uh, really well off, but we've saved enough to, to renovate our house, put it that way, and to build the coach house is, is less than it would be for our daughters to try to find um, housing nearby. And of course, um, Susan's mom moved out from Richmond years ago to be, watch her daughters grow up and be with family and stuff. And so we thought of this as the best way for everyone to be together. Um, the district has done a fantastic job uh, with the new development with Polygon. Um, I've never seen anything like it uh, done to that level of, of excellence. Uh, everything from the, the tidal zone to the eagles now nesting in the neighborhood. Um, we want to follow with that excellence and really make this property nice to look at and to live in. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, the next speaker is, um, and please correct me if I have not said your name um, properly, Cave Fard. That's right, that's me. Did I get your name? Yes, correct? it's Cave. Cave, yeah. thank you, yeah, welcome. You, you have three minutes to address council. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship and councillors for allowing me to speak in. Uh, Today's meeting. Um, I'm a proud uh, resident of Lane Valley and uh, I've been living here for almost uh, seven and a half years with my family. And uh, we love Lane Valley area, uh, as most of you do. <laughs> Recently, we've been informed by mail that there is a proposed uh, development to build that, um, a two four story building at 1630 Lane Valley. This is where uh, Royal Canadian uh, Legion is located. I want to share my view about this, this proposal. Um, when, when I moved to this location, I checked the OCP, and this is one of the things we checked. And, uh, and, and in the OCP, at least the way that I understood, it, it clearly promises to protect the form and character of the neighborhood. And this neighborhood where I'm living, and this proposal is, is suggested, um, is 100% residential, uh, single home family. This proposal is a two, four story building. And, uh, and, and again, it's just right in the middle of the 100% single family residential home. The direction that is set by, uh, by OCP, the way that I'm reading it and I'm understanding is 
is to limit the growth and changes. Um, this, this proposal is, is about, uh, is more than a kilometer, the way that I'm checking with the, the Google map, uh, from where the, uh, the, the, the main development activities are happening and where the library, save on food, and those buildings are, uh, are building. Um, I don't think this is the right approach uh, for doing it this way. Again, looking at OCP as a guideline, uh, this, this land uh, is better used uh, for a single family home, uh, maybe hometown, uh, two-story hometown perhaps, uh, uh, if, if that can be served better for the location. Uh, this, if this goes through, this, uh, this, I think this is the right, this is not the right precedent that we're setting in the district of North Vancouver for future development. Densification has a, needs to have a right place, and this is not the right place for doing this. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, for letting me share my my view and, and input with, with all of you councillors, uh, and looking forward to have more dialogues and conversations around this this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the the next speaker is Pauline Sanderson. Hi, you have three minutes to address council. Uh, good evening, Acting Mayor Curran and council members. Uh, I'm from Lynn Valley, and I would first like to say thank you to all of you for the ways in which you've supported and showed up for the community in the past couple of weeks after the terrible events of March 28th. We really appreciate it. I, too, am part of a neighborhood nearby the Lynn Valley Legion property at 1630 Lynn Valley Road, and the draft proposal has just been released March 30th. And the proposal is to rezone the land on Lynn Valley Road from public assembly to accommodate a medium density apartment complex of 96 units. The size and density of this project has created deep concern and dissension in our community. I will be opposing this application primarily because I feel it's out of line with the district's OCP, which states the intent to keep density in the town centers in the district and to perform, preserve the character of neighborhoods. But I'm not here to give you all my reasons to reject any formal application that arises out of this. I do want to raise one point that I think is important district-wide. I believe that we need to protect the integrity of public assembly lands that we have in the district. Taking a look at the district zoning map, there just isn't a lot of privately owned PA land left, and we aren't going to suddenly find more anytime soon. Given the very evident increase in population, it's hard to think we won't need it in the future. Rezoning PA land and trading it for some space in a residential building seems to me to be a poor deal in the long run, especially for the community. I hope there is a lot of thought and vision that goes into this discussion because I believe that its decision involving rezoning PA land that is located in the middle of single family residential zoning would be precedent setting for all the other PA lands across the district. Finances may be tough for a number of nonprofits and churches who are mainly the owners of the private PA lands, but if possible, I believe we should work together to broaden the discussion to help ensure the preservation of this type of property. Space sharing with other like-minded organizations or uses that are compatible with the property owners would be a good start. And I think the support of the broader community is going to be essential in order to preserve public assembly land. Can we encourage more discussion with the local neighborhoods so that people understand the heart and the mission of those who own and steward these properties? Especially if the PA property owners feel their only solution is rezoning into big developments. Even during COVID, online engagement tools such as placespeak.com or possibly Civil Space, which are the developers of the tool that the district uses, those uh, tools are available for developers and applicants to gather local input effectively. If we intentionally plan, on the other hand, for PA lands to slowly become residential with designated space for public assembly uses, then that's one thing. But if the district ends up finding that it has slowly, let, slowly allowed all the PA lands to be rezoned into residential with little actual PA land remaining, then I suggest we've not done our collective task of envisioning the future for generations to come. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. I was just about to, uh, you were over time a bit, but um, I'm glad you were drawing it to a close. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and thank you. I also want to acknowledge uh, the community and staff um, really coming together around the tragic events in Lynn Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, our thoughts remain with everyone um, impacted by um, that event. Thank you for that. Um, the next um, up this evening, we have some recognitions. Um, and I know that Mayor Little uh, would, would like to be here, but he is unable to, so I'm going to share um, some words. This evening is the 2021 Heritage Awards and Design um, Excellence Awards. Um, so he'd like to welcome everyone. Um, and just a bit by way of background, every year around this time, we look back at new projects that exemplify design excellence, as well as various projects, people, and organizations that contribute to heritage conservation and advocacy in our community. A lot has changed um, in the world since last year's awards night where everyone got together, share some food and laughter. Um, while I'll miss that, I very much appreciate everyone joining us tonight in this online format. To begin the awards ceremony this evening, I'm honored to have Chief Bill Williams, Hereditary Chief of Squamish Nation, join us and offer a traditional welcome. Um, Chief Williams, thank you so much for joining us and um, I will hand it over to you. Hoi I'd like to, um... Thank the, the district for, for putting together such a, a wonderful award so people of our community can look at, at the wonderful things that has been happening in, in the community and, and be able to reflect on, on the good work that the community has done over the years to be able to fully participate as, as members of the community. And, and the acknowledgement is really important for our children to, to recognize where they come from and who they are, because it, it is this, this foundation that gives them the, the, the path of life to be able to do the thing that they, they do. I'd like to um, ask you to think of your family and friends at this time. And um, we, we'd like to thank the Creator for giving us such a blessed day today. We'd thank, like to thank the Creator for putting comfort in the hearts and minds of people who have lost loved ones in our families and our communities. We'd like to thank the Creator for putting a special bubble around the youth of our community to recognize who they are and where they come from and don't have to go through the trials and tribulations of the drugs and the alcohol. We'd like to thank the Creator for putting a special bubble around each and every one of you and especially your family members to be able to do the things that you do and, and not worry about um, getting hurt or getting sick and, and, and be able to do that work in a way that that is progressive and in a way that will, will always um, create good feeling and happiness within the family and the community itself. We we like to thank the Creator for this true blessing of this day. Well, one of the things that uh, I wanted to, to mention is, is the uh, Lacole uh, Elementary School and the work that was acknowledgement that is going to happen there. It, it is very important for the children. And I was very happy to look at the pictures of all the children at that school who participated in, in the raising of, of uh, unveiling of the, the, the welcome figure with, with a paddle. Because the paddle is very important to Coast Salish people, in, 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 in fact, because that was our main highway. That was the way that we traveled around the Coast Salish territory. And, and for the children to know that, it is very, very heartwarming uh, for myself and the members of the Squamish community or, or members of the Coast Salish community as a whole. So I'd like to thank you for the acknowledgement and, and the award that you'll be giving out today because they are well-deserved. Have a good evening. Hoichika. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to have you join us this evening and thank you for those beautiful words. Um, I am gonna pass um, the Zoom over to um, Kevin Zhang, um, who is going to present the 2020 Design Excellence Awards. At least that's what I think is supposed to happen. <laughs> Am I right? Hello? Can you hear me? Kevin, we can't hear you. Oh. Very quiet. Hello? Got to speak up louder. Is it? Can you hear me now? That's much better. Oh, excellent. 
and uh, Nicole will be helping me with the uh, with the slides. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council and members of the public. My name is Kevin Zhang, Development Planner with the District and also Staff Liaison to the Advisory Design Panel. I'm here tonight to provide an overview of the design, the Advisory Design Panel and as well as announce this year's nominees and winners of the Design Excellence Awards. Nicole Foth will be presenting the Heritage Awards right after. Next slide. Thank you. So the, the Advisory Design Panel is a technical committee made up of design and industry professionals in the fields of architecture, landscape architecture, public art, inclusivity and accessibility, engineering, development, construction, and public safety. These panel members are volunteers, residents of the North Shore, and appointed by council. Let's let this slide go away. I think we just lost the, there we go, it's back. Oh, there we go, even bigger, bigger and better. The mandate of the panel is to review all major development applications against district plans, policies, and design best practices, and ultimately provide advice to staff. This includes looking at the overall design, material choices, and sometimes even playground placement. Next slide, please. On a large scale, it means helping resolve complex site issues, such as um, overall pedestrian experience and impacts and shadowing. On a smaller scale, it means ensuring that accessible residences are designed to the highest accessibility standards. And at this point, I want to take a moment to give recognition to our panel members for 2020. Carolyn Kennedy, Chair and Landscape Architect. Andre Chinsinevsky, Architect. Eric Ng, Architect. Kim Smith, Architect. James Blake, Engineer. Nancy Paul, Landscape Architect. Don Aldersley, Construction Industry Representative. Sergeant Kevin Bracewell, RCMP. Nathan Shuttleworth, Development Representative. Reva Nelson, Accessibility Representative. And finally, Grace Gordon Collins, Public Art Representative. We're very lucky to have so many local professionals who volunteer their precious evenings to help shape our communities. Thank you very much. And now onto the awards. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in 1992, the Design Excellence Awards program was established to recognize and promote design excellence. Over the years, we've had many exemplary projects that have made contributions to our built environment. These projects, as you can see, range from residential towers to community centers, from mixed use developments to commercial buildings. Next slide. And of course, this year is no different we again have a strong field of nominees. First is a large mixed use development in the Lionsgate Village, uh, the Lionsgate Village Center that also contains a public plaza and a future community center. Second in the same neighborhood is a recently completed townhouse project that had to carefully bridge the transition between a denser village core and the Capilano River. Moving east to Marine Drive, Tatlow Homes is a four-story mixed-use building with a different take on the district's design guidelines in order to set itself apart from the neighboring developments. And lastly, the residences at Lynn Valley has dramatically changed Lynn Valley's commercial core with new residential and commercial opportunities. Next slide, please. And after careful review, the panel has awarded two Design Excellence Awards for 2020. The first Design Excellence Award is awarded to Holland Road Townhomes by PC Urban Properties, Grimwood Architecture, and ETA Landscape Architecture. The panel specifically congratulates the design team on achieving a balance of both density and livability while respecting the riparian setback of the Capilano River to the north a high quality, uh, high quality materials and finishes, and a color palette that also relates to the surrounding environment. Next slide, please. 
And the second Design Excellence Award is awarded to the residences at Lynn Valley by Boza Development, Krista Giacos Architects, ETA Landscape Architecture, once again, and Dam Nogales for Public Art. The panel specifically congratulates the design team on a consistent desi design language across such a large project that helps achieve a cohesive village-like character. The choice of materials and colors, especially the warmth created by the timber and stone. And finally, a dramatic improvement to the public realm along with the addition of public art that is both visually compelling and playful. And that brings an end to the 2020 Design Excellence Awards. Congratulations to both winners and nominees tonight. I will now hand the floor back to Acting Mayor Kuhn. Thank you so much for that um, presentation, Kevin, and thanks to our um, advisory design panel for all their work and congratulations to the winners of this year's Design Excellence Awards. And I'm going to now um, hand the floor over to Nicole Foth, um, who's going to present the 2020 Heritage Awards. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those joining in, I'm Nicole Foth from Community Planning, and I'm happy to be presenting the 2020 Community Heritage Awards this evening. The Heritage Awards are presented each year to recognize and honor the efforts of individuals or groups involved in promoting and conserving heritage in the District of North Vancouver. Heritage Award recipients are selected by the District's Community Heritage Advisory Committee. The Heritage Committee includes volunteers with expertise or an interest in local history, architecture, building restoration, and heritage conservation. The current committee members, who many of them are probably joining in to listen to this uh, uh, call and, and watch the Zoom tonight, are uh, Anne Saville, the chair, Alistair Moore, Bob Muckle, Jim Paul, Jennifer Clay, Mel Montgomery, Phil Bainton, Rob Greasdale, and Councillor Matthew Bond is the council representative on the committee. So thank you to uh, all the committee members for their work and involvement. The committee advises and provides support on heritage conservation activities in the district like these heritage awards. So tonight I am honored to present five awards to recognize the efforts of homeowners, volunteers, cultural leaders, and advocates who demonstrate heritage promotion and conservation in the district. The awards are presented in no particular order. This 2020 Heritage Award is given to 777 Crystal Court in recognition of the renovation of this heritage home. This home is valued for its mid-century post and beam architectural features. Renovations involved the extension of the upper and lower levels at the rear of this home. An admiral effort has been undertaken to extend the roof choice to replicate the materials and originals of the original beams. In the interior upgrades help extend the life of this home. Though so this award is presented uh, on behalf of the house to owners Shelley and David Alt. And so I believe they've joined us on the call tonight. So thank you. And with this award, the District of North Vancouver thanks Mr. and Ms. Alt for their extensive and thoughtful renovation to this heritage home. This 2020 Heritage Award is given to 1255 Ridgewood Drive in recognition of the renovation and preservation of this heritage home. This house was built in 1946 and is one of the earliest known works of well-known uh, West Coast architect, Fred Hollingsworth. Recent renovations were to improve its livability and enhance its energy efficiency while retaining much of the original architectural features. It included replacement of the windows with sympathetic wood-framed windows and installation of a new heat recovery system. Many design features such as the floating ceiling, timber flooring, and clear story windows were preserved and restored. Careful thought was put into maintaining consistency with the house's original style, materials, and colors. 
This award is presented to, uh, on behalf of the host of the owners, Ting Kui Wong and Dan Feng. Thank you. This award, um, the, with this award, the District of North Vancouver thanks Ms. Wong and Mr. Feng for their efforts to preserve the spirit of the architect's original vision for this building. This 2020 Heritage Award is given to 2357 Riverside Drive in recognition for a renovation and preservation of this heritage home. This house is a unique representation of the West Coast modern architectural style in North Vancouver. This house has been well maintained over the years and with most recent renovations to extend the building's life as well as promote its cultural history. Restoration work included exterior painting and the addition of structural supports to the main deck and restoration of the deck with granite tiles. Local First Nations artwork is also integrated into the main deck, linking the residence's connection to renowned artist Bill Reed, who once had his art studio in this house. This award is presented uh, to Michael, to owner Michael Smith. With this award, the District of North Vancouver thanks Mr. Smith for his efforts to preserve this heritage home. This next 2020 Heritage Award is presented to the Lynn Valley Community Association for the Lynn Valley Link Trail kiosks. Lynn Valley Community Association volunteers are active in community-driven initiatives for the benefit of the community. And this project, the Link Trail, was a collaborative project between Lynn Valley Community Association and the District's Parks Department, starting in 2016 and completed in 2019. The trail spans over 14 kilometers and was created to showcase the extensive trail network in Lynn Valley. Six informational kiosks along the trail highlight local heritage information where the kiosk is located. The information was researched and written by Lynn Valley Community Association members. The kiosks provide visitors a glimpse of some of Lynn Valley's heritage and are a great example of providing a way for the public to discover heritage in Lynn Valley. This award is presented to the Lynn Valley Community Association. And this evening, uh, Suzanne Mazare is uh, here to receive it on behalf of the Community Association and in recognition for her involvement in the Link Trail project. With this award, the District of North Vancouver thanks the Lynn Valley Community Association for their efforts to show the district's history and heritage. This next 2020 Heritage Award is given to the welcome figure at La Cole Cleveland Elementary. The welcome figure was carved in 2016 by lead artist Latash Maurice Nahaney, a member of the Squamish Nation, and carving assistant Chris Fife. The welcome figure is made of a red cedar tree donated by a patron of the school and was carved on site at the school. All students and staff had the opportunity to contribute to the carving of the welcome figure and learning about the process. The Squamish Nation is part of the Coast Salish Cultural Group, whose traditional territory includes North Vancouver and North Shore. The welcome figure is a human figure gripping a paddle that stands with its hands raised in a sign of welcome and friendship representing the teachings and values important both to the Coast Salish and the school. With the welcome figure, LaCole Cleveland Elementary is promoting respect for self, respect for others, respect for the environment, fitness, and health. This award is presented to Latash Maurice Nahaney and Cleveland Elementary School. To receive the award on behalf of Cleveland Elementary, uh, tonight we have on the call Principal Joe Campbell, Vice Principal Laura Stewart, and former Principal Bill Reed. With this award, the District of North Vancouver thanks Mr. Mahaney and LaCole Elementary, at LaCole Cleveland Elementary, for their efforts to showcase local Indigenous art, culture, and heritage in the district. Thank you to all our Heritage Award recipients for attending this evening uh, on this uh, virtual style Heritage Awards ceremony event and being with us so we can celebrate your contributions to preserve and promote heritage in the district. 
We'll be in touch with the recipients to coordinate how to deliver the physical award certificates. Thank you very much. Councillor Kern, I'll pass it back to you now. Thank you so much for your presentation, Nicole, and to all the committee members. And um, of course, congratulations to all the winners of this year's awards. I think it was great to hear everything from heat pumps to retrofits to carving, um, working um, with um, someone from Squamish, a carver from Squamish Nation and the school elementary school. So thank you. Um, for that. So that wraps up the 2020 Design Excellence and Heritage Awards. Um, and I really wanted to, again, thank uh, Chief Williams for joining us and to um, thank everyone who participated. And we're going to carry on with the rest of this evening. Um, so if you came um, specifically for the awards ceremony, you're welcome to stay. It's going to be riveting. Um, but if you would like to leave, um, we certainly understand that. So you can just um, pop off the Zoom call. So we're going to move on to our delegation. Very pleased to welcome Joy Hayden um, from Hollyburn Family Services Society. And Joy, you have five minutes to um, present to council. Uh, thank you, Mayor Welcome. and uh, Council. Um, Mike Thorne is going to be presenting with me as well, so I'm going to share the screen and let Mike start. Thank you. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Joy. Okay. So let me just uh, get a slideshow. Thank you, Acting Mayor and Council. My name is Mike Thorne, and I'm on the Hollyburn Family Services Society Board of Directors. It's our pleasure to provide you with an overview of our past year. Presenting with me this evening is Joy Hayden, a Director of Innovation and Engagement. Next slide. This slide provides you with a brief introduction to our agency. Worth mentioning is that the board is actively involved in updating our strategic plan. This is our existing version and mission. So stay tuned for a new version in the near future. Next slide. Before I hand it over to uh, uh, Joy to speak on our work over the past year, I'd like to introduce uh, the board of directors, many who are members are listening in tonight and are uh, residents of the district. Alan Quinter is our board chair, David Aris and Lynn Green are co-vice chairs. Lynn is a district resident. Bob Tanaka is our treasurer and Nancy Farron is our secretary. Nancy was recently elected to the board at our January AGM along with Kevin Evans. Our other directors at large include Chelsea Dill, Jason Wexler, Paul Tuch, Christine Alsup, and myself, who are also di district uh, residents. And I'll pass it back to Joy. Next uh, slide. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity. It was about a year ago I was presenting to you in person, and in reflection, it's been quite the year. So I'm going to move through these slides fairly quickly, um, but as you can see, the District of North Vancouver has played a significant role in helping us advance our mission of addressing social issues. And as we look forward to the near future, uh, we know that with your support, we can make a significant difference across our communities on the North Shore and address social issues. I'm very happy to report that we've continued all of our services during COVID-19, and it's been very challenging on those that we support. This uh, slide represents our youth services and youth uh, requiring support has increased 21% since the same period last year. Uh, staff are reporting that they're struggling with their mental wellness as we know, but on a positive note, I'd like to say that the four youth living in Orwell House, a home provided by the District of North Vancouver, are doing excellent. They have absolutely flourished and they are so thankful for this opportunity to learn how to live independently and then move on to um, permanent housing. Sadly, seniors are still facing issues in our community. Over the past six months as a result of COVID, the most notable trend that we've seen is a tripling of clients who needed eviction prevention services, uh, assistance, and an increase in homelessness by 50% of all of the support that we've provided. Over 90 seniors uh, from across the district of North Vancouver have accessed our services. We, um, in the community-based victim services support, our service volume increased 18% since the last period last year, and the rate of domestic violence cases have almost doubled since pre-pandemic levels. This is a grave issue that's been exasperated because of COVID-19. 
Um, I just want to make a clarification on this slide. I've got an estimated 100 plus sexual assaults. I haven't been able to get that number confirmed. I do know that the number of cases of sexual assault on the North Shore are high. I know that the amount of cases that are not reported are even higher, um, but we know, let's face it, one sexual assault is one too many. As we entered into COVID-19, our all levels of government have been absolutely remarkable, ensuring that money can get down to the people that need it. Uh, we've raised significant money to support people across the North Shore with community services, close to almost $300,000. And as you can see, it's gone across into grocery cards, it's gone to cover rent, it's putting uh, people into motels for safety purposes. Uh, it's been a very active uh, year and uh, very thankful for that emergency funding. And this is just shows you a little bit of where that funding has gone across of our three sectors. And just to touch on our organizational highlights, um, we have just an increase in housing development of opportunities. As uh, Mike said, we've welcomed five new board members. We've updated our policies, we've hired new staff, and we have a uh, cohesive infrastructure procedures. And as he said, we're working on our strategic planning. So we're excited to move that back to you. So at this point, I am going to pass it over to Michael to finish up with the slides. Thanks, Joy. This, uh, without a doubt, this has been a difficult year for everyone. We want to recognize those who stood up, rolled up their sleeves and got the work done. This includes staff, our board, our funders, our community, and you, the District of North Vancouver. So we just finally like to say thank you very much for your participation. And thank you. So we can answer any questions. Thank you for that. Every time I'm about to say your time is up, you just conclude. Beautifully. So thank you um, for that presentation. Um, do I have a motion from I'll move council? receipt. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillor Hansen. Thank you. Councillor Murray. Um, thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Was uh, was it um did you did you feel during the last year that you had people slip through the cracks because of the inability to connect um, uh, physically? Um, they were relying on um, using uh, phones um, to communicate with you. Um, what were some of the challenges and, and what, did you feel like there was a group that was maybe lost uh, with what we were dealing with? Good question and very interesting when COVID first hit and they said stay indoors you know, and isolate yourselves, that was taken very literally. And all of our services slowed down to a certain degree, but we were able to reach out and say, we're still open. We still have our safe houses available to you. We still have our transitional housing. We still have all of our services. We're just gonna do it a little bit differently. So in that, then they started coming and we are absolutely full at this point. Um, yeah, the vulnerable, and, and we recognize this moving forward, that those that were on the cusp of vulnerability were going to fall into that abyss. And that certainly is what we're seeing if we're seeing senior homelessness increasing at 50% uh, over this past year. Uh, I mean, we, we know women fleeing violence is a huge issue and all COVID has done is just made their lives absolutely dangerous and, and in, you know, in such peril. So I don't think there's been any group specifically that has fallen into, um, into a gap or that we haven't been able to access. Um, and I think because of the emergency money, we could get people iPads, we could get them telephones, we could get them instruction on how to do that. And certainly working with all of our community partners, I think that has been really, really impactful in getting people connected to those services. Is there an, indi <clears throat> excuse me, is there an indication from senior levels of government that funding will continue, um, increased funding will continue to organizations uh, such as yours, um, given that we're still in a third wave, I guess um, we're gonna call it, and we still have a ways to go, it sounds like. At this point, the federal government is committing additional funding to the Reaching Home program, which is the program that supports people who are either, either experiencing homelessness or on the risk of homelessness. Uh, so that it, we know that there's new funding that's going to become available that we will absolutely access if required. Um, I don't know of any other funding sources that we have seen through the Community Foundations of Canada or United Way if those will get renewed. And then um, just your numbers, Joy, that you presented in regards to 
youth and we had about 80, I think, in the district. And then seniors, I think the number was about 94. Um, so the remainder would be City of North Vancouver. What's the break? What's the, the break? And then West Vancouver? And then West Vancouver. So th those accessing our services, the majority are from the city of North Vancouver, and we see anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of district um, clients, depending on what service and when, and then anywhere between 10 and 25 percent in West district of West Vancouver. Are they mainly women and children? Uh, no, it's it's a large, it's a fairly neutral breakdown, depending on whether you're looking at our youth services, our senior services, or our community-based victim services. Um, so in community-based, yes, it's the majority women, but there are also men that are, you know, victims of domestic violence or, gen or violence in general. So, um, but in the other programs, it's fairly close to a 50-50 split requiring services. And just to, um, and my last question would be just to remind myself in regards to how the process works, but now that we've, um, this council's focused on affordable housing and the projects that are coming online eventually, it's, there's still obviously, um, some of them are in the early stages, but will you be feeding the operators of those um, uh, housing projects uh, recommendations in regards to people that are in need of housing will you are you we, is, is that an automatic process that you're included in it, it is an automatic process i would hope that we're included in but if it's a bc housing funded program what we would do is uh with our the people that we support and working with the other agencies encouraging the individuals to get um um in touch with BC Housing to get on the wait list. And then of course we can hopefully select people who are from the district of North Vancouver for district housing. So that's the first step. If they require any levels of subsidy, they're going to have to be on that registration with BC Housing. So we'll hold hands uh, with individuals and business and other nonprofits to support people to do that. That's good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hansen. Thank you very much, uh, Joy and Michael, for your presentation. And uh, more than that, thank you for the work you've done in, in the community. You've been such an important uh, a measure during the last uh, 12 months and the, the uh, interventions that you've provided are obviously uh, very important to our community. And we thank you for that. Um, I, I'm struck as I, I was struck as I am often struck uh, by the discussion of seniors homelessness. Uh, and you uh, said and then repeated the 50% increase in uh, seniors' homelessness. And uh, it just seems to me that's uh, too important an issue and too important a statement to let pass without dwelling on it a little bit. Um, Joy, a couple of questions about that. Um, first of all, do you have an explanation as to why there's been a 50% increase in seniors' homelessness in the last year? What are, what are the um, contributing factors that we need to identify uh, that are increasing seniors' homelessness? Uh, but also, if you could give us any kind of an estimate of the number of seniors that are currently, as we speak, uh, this evening, homeless uh, across the North Shore. Um, if you could provide that, I think it would be of assistance. And also, uh, is there a breakdown between women and men amongst these uh, senior homeless people? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there a difference between men and women? I, it, it, it depends. It's a fairly close split of 50-50, um, but that can waver. Sometimes we'll see, you know, 42% and a 58%. And a um, it seems to challenge. I think the issues over COVID-19, and I, and I can't answer your questions, but I'm happy to send this to you um, later on with uh, detail on those numbers. I don't have them in front of me right now. And for me to go into my computer to find it, I'm going to mess up your Zoom, so we're not going to do that. Uh, so I think that COVID-19 is just so What's kept seniors housed, let's start with that, has been the, um, the, uh, the policy bylaw to not evict individuals. But the problem is that people are unable to pay their rent. Once that's lifted, we're seeing people that now all of a sudden they, they can't pay the rent and they're being evicted. We see in our world sometimes um, illegal rentals. And so it's under the wire. And so therefore evictions are not always 
followed within the Residential Tenancy Act. And so we'll find out somebody's been evicted a little bit too late to address that. Um, just the lack of housing on the North Shore. And again, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I, last time I recall, I don't know how many seniors are on a wait list for one unit of coming in for affordable housing. So the District of North Vancouver, you're doing the absolute right thing in, in encouraging affordable housing, both with the de developers, asking them to provide um, the below market housing, and certainly your initiatives on providing the land for some of the affordable housing that's almost close to being shovel ready or that are in the pipeline to be ready. And that's what we need to do. We need to just ensure that our seniors and our young adults, I think if you caught on one of that slide, like our young adults are having a heck of a hard time finding housing. And with the Anthem proposal that came through um, a few months ago, the amount of young people that were standing up and speaking in front of you, well, virtually and saying like, I need housing. I can't get housing. I need housing on bus routes. I, you know, the rent to own intrigues me. And we're starting to see that. And what we need for our young adults, particularly those that are marginalized, is a subsidy system very similar to what the SAFER offers for BC housing. Wouldn't it be great if you've got a kid who's working so hard, but he's got minimum wage and he just can't afford his rent, that there was some way that could bridge his income to his rent. We could start to curb that homelessness issue that we're starting to see with young adults as well. Uh, but Councillor Hansen and, and the Mayor, Acting Mayor and Council, I will definitely forward that information to you so you have that specifically at your fingertips. Yeah, thank you very much. And again, thank you for the work you do in our community. And thank you. Uh, Council, it appears Councillor or Acting Mayor Curran has uh, lost power or disconnected. Um, what we normally do is uh, amongst yourselves elect uh, an acting acting mayor. Does anybody <laughs> want to step forward? Uh, Councillor, well, okay. Um, Take charge, Councillor Mary. Thank you. Councillor Forbes, you're next. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the report, uh, Joe and our Joy and Mike. Um, I think what I, the information I was looking for has partially been answered by Council, Councillor Mary and Councillor Hansen's questions to you. But if I saw correctly when the slides were going, um, about 64 seniors were evicted. Um, and you've explained that for a while there, there was a freeze and now there's not a freeze. And so most of that I assume has happened fairly recently. And the question that I would ask along with that is, um, were you able to keep them in North Vancouver or do you work to place people wherever you can place them when you're working in partnerships with other organizations, maybe in, in Vancouver or Burnaby, wherever. Did you manage to keep most of those on the North Shore? Our first attempt is to always keep them on the North Shore, in particular when it's seniors, because when you remove them from their community, you're removing them from their social network, you're removing them from their health network, and we see a decline in their health. But the reality is, is that sometimes we have to move them off the North Shore. Um, the Lions, the Kiwanis, Brightside Housing, these are fabulous partners who really assist us in housing the seniors. But at the end of the day, if the only place that we can find them affordable housing is in Burnaby, Richmond, or Surrey, then we want to work with them and help them integrate into that new community. So um, percentage wise, I think, I think even during COVID-19, we were able to house people on the North Shore. Um, but yeah, there's a large number that are housed off the North Shore. And I think what's important to also stipulate here is that there are in some cases where the senior will choose to remain homeless or living in their vehicle or couch surfing than to leave their beloved community for very much the reasons that I spoke about. Yeah, I've heard that. So that's what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we're trying to get there and we're trying to get help for all of these people. And I think we're going in the right direction. It's just now time to get it, like you say, shovel in the ground and get going. Get it moving. Yeah. And you are in the right direction. And we uh, just applaud you so much for taking that direction and getting this housing moving forward. Thank you very much. And thank you for the report. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Mary. I think you stepped in. Uh, we literally lost power in my house because that would happen when you were chairing a meeting. Um, back on. Where are we? Who would like we're, to speak? I think we've exhausted the speakers list and uh, it's been moved and seconded. Oh, well, I'll just, I'll just.
uh, say thank you, um, Joy, and nice to meet you, um, Mike. And um, we look forward to continuing um, a relationship. I really appreciate um, everything that you've done. And I think there's a lot we can learn um, by, by learning about the, the work that you're doing and um, who you're working with and finding better ways to connect. Um, some of those statistics are quite alarming, but of course the statistics are people, they're not statistics. So um, I think that's really important to remember. Um, Councilor Beck. Can't hear you. I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? For technology. Huh. There you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Joy. And thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your presentation. Thank you for all of the incredible work that you do all the time, um, but in particular over the last year. Um, I was just going to ask a question to you, Joy, around um, working with some of the other agencies on the North Shore. Um, in a lot of the cases, you're serving some of the same populations. And I wonder how much um, sort of collaboration or coordination there is among the different agencies like Hollyburn. I think the collaboration is absolutely amazing. And I think that's really driven by our staff team that they know that they can't do it on their own. There's sometimes we step on toes, but our, our intent is not to. Um, our intent is to not duplicate a service that's already in existence within the community, but rather to work with those service providers and provide our assistance. And I think the collaborations across the North Shore are, I've been you know, working on the North Shore for so many years and I, think it's the best it's ever been. And perhaps that's COVID-19 related, um, but we saw with the, the West Vancouver Seniors Activity Center distribute um, uh, technology to seniors, but that, those were also North Shore seniors and our gift cards were going to other organizations that we received to support seniors uh, for groceries. Um, so it isn't just like, okay, we got all this emergency money, we're only gonna help our clients. Like our staff reached right out there and helped so many. So it, yeah, like I say, I think it's best collaborations that I've seen in decades. That's great. And that's, that's really good to hear. And that's kind of where I was leading with that is what, what COVID has kind of done for that uh, sort of collaborative effort across the North Shore. But uh, thank you for always being there and for the work that you do. It, it is very much appreciated. And anything we can do to support you, you know, whether that's on the housing front or any other areas, um, I'm fully supportive. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Back. So has everyone had a chance, an opportunity to speak from Council? So the motion has been uh, received, the motion to receive has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Um, anyone opposed? Well, thank you so much and look forward to continuing to work together, Joy. We have a lot still to catch up on, but <laughs> we'll save yeah. it for another day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item is the adoption of the minutes. Um, moved. Second. All in favor? Oh, I think Betty has a question about the minutes. Actually, maybe you can confirm it, Councillor Mary. It was um, on page 28, um, 811. I think both of you and I were uh, absent for that vote. Can staff comment on the minutes on page 28, you said? Sorry, I'm not fine. I'm not there. Yes, 28 under 811. Uh, and then yes, your worship, just checking my notes. And I have uh, as noted in the minutes, Councillor Forbes uh, recusing herself. Uh, I don't have any note about Councillor Mary. I think I was away that, I was not at that meeting at all. I was away that evening. You're listed as being- uh, that, is, that is correct. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. So just wanted to catch that. that. Okay, so uh, Your Worship, that's moved and seconded. Yes. Is that accurate, Council? Moved and seconded. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, motion carries. So the next item um, up for, um, is actually just up for adoption. Um, so this is item 8.1. 
Oh, sorry, I, I did miss the um, reports. Oh, this is the report. Okay, um, 8.1. Um, and um, do I have someone to move? I'll, I'll move it. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Han, and seconded by Councillor Murray. Um, so there's no discussion at adoption. So I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? With um, Councillor Forbes opposed. Thank you, Your Worship. We have that. So moving on to item 8.2, the UBCM 2021 Strengthening Communities Services Program. Um, council, do we ever do we have a staff report? Your Worship, Miss Atva is available to provide a brief introduction. Thank you, Miss Atva. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, through Your Worship, members of Council, and and our public uh, community members who are here as well. This report outlines a grant opportunity that would support, would support vulnerable community members who have faced a number of challenges that have been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. This funding is made available through a federal and provincial Safe Start Restart Agreement to manage the impacts of the pandemic. And particularly, it's the Strengthening Communities Services Program that is available here to support mm -hmm. unsheltered homeless populations and also address community impacts. We are proposing a North Shore op application with, the, with us, the district, the city of North Van as our lead applicant, the district of West Van, and in partnership with the Squamish Nation, Nation the Slave Tooth Nation, and Lookout Housing and Health Society. This funding is meant to parallel what uh, provincial efforts are already happening, but also really just to bridge the period between the outbreak of COVID and the post-COVID recovery. So it's meant to be a temporary program. The application that uh, is being prepared is proposed to be for up to $2.5 million. And if approved, the activities would have to be completed within one year. This North Shore project just briefly would include a number of proposed or possible activities. For example, an indigenous outreach team with full and part-time outreach workers, mobile services, things for example, like a vehicle equipped with hygiene and health facilities. Uh, services that could be of a fixed location, for example, also might be sanitation, hygiene related, warming or cooling centers, and the exact location would be dependent on each municipality's unique needs and subject to feasibility and engagement. And lastly, the project would also looks at a number of ways to improve coordination and capacity to respond to the needs of homeless individuals, but also community concerns. This grant is through UBCM. It requires a council resolution. And the two recommendations are that staff are directed to work with the city of North Vancouver and district of West Vancouver to submit a joint regional application to secure funding under this uh, 2021 program. And that council supports the city of North Vancouver as the primary applicant to receive and manage this funding on the district of North Vancouver's behalf. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Atva, for the presentation. Council, what's your pleasure? I'll move the staff recommendation. Moved by Councillor Back. Is there a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Murray. Any comments? Just a brief comment. I'm really pleased that this is a North Shore approach. I liked how we are working with the neighboring municipalities. And I know that uh, Squamish and tsleil -Tooth will be involved, um, like that there's outreach and mobile services as part of the um, initiatives here. We know that hidden homeless is, is a big part of the homeless problem on the North Shore. And um, so we yeah, are very supportive of this. Thank you, Councillor Mary. Um, yeah, I'm supportive of it as well. Um, there's different programs, there's capital needed in some of the initiatives that have been laid out in the report. Um, I think the important part of that would be if we are successful and we do pick ones that have capital injection, um, how will they be funded uh, when the money runs out um, as we go forward? So it's just something to consider um, when we're making decisions on uh, uh, which ones will be successful and how they'll be funded into the future. Thank you, council. Any other comments from council? Uh, 
We'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So moving on to item 8.3, which is a development uh, variance permit for 4048 Dollarton Highway. And I believe we had a speaker sign up. I'm not sure if Kevin Lee has is here, St um, clerk. Uh, your worship uh, no he is not present yet um so uh you could proceed if uh, there's a motion discussion if he pops up we'll let you know and um if i'll he move can, the recommendation if he can capture the window um he can get in otherwise we move on thank you so councillor Mary has moved it is there a seconder for the staff recommendation second by count thank you seconded by councillor back councillor Mary. Um, thank you. I, um, I actually know this property quite well. An old friend of mine used to own this house. Um, it sits high above the Dollarton. Um, it's set back on the property. And um, I noted that the, um, the addition of having a coach house in the front yard is a little unusual. It probably doesn't happen all that often, but certainly there's no lane access and it is on a bit of a hill. Um, uh, but I think the, um, the drawing that's included in the report um, actually is very sensitive to the house as it, it sits on the property. And uh, it actually looks as though it is just one house. Um, there's quite a large sort of uh, glass uh, rotunda on the entryway where the stairwell goes up to the main level. And, uh, and I think the architect's done a really nice job to um, you know, sit this um, far enough back on the lot um, that it does just sort of meld in with the existing um, structure. So um, I think this is a, a creative way to allow a coach house to exist on a front piece of property and there'll be no impact um, that I can tell um, from, the, uh, from the Dollarton or maybe slightly to the neighbor to the west, but we haven't heard anything, so I'm sure it's fine. So I'll be supporting this application. Thanks, Councillor Mary. And I apologize, um, Michael, <laughs> if you had a, a presentation, um, we can kind of go back to that if you'd like, just so everyone is aware. Uh, Acting Mayor Curran, I did not have a presentation. I had some introductory comments, but uh, maybe I'll just leave it if there's questions. I'm available to answer questions. That sounds good. Thank you for that. Um, so Councillor Beck. Uh, thank you very much. And Councillor Mary did a fine job of outlining uh, this particular um, coach house. I agree with all of her comments. I think it's um, really uh, blends in very nicely with the main house that's on the property. It is non-traditional being in the front yard as it is here, but I think the applicant has done an excellent job of really making it fit in uh, quite nicely and um, always uh, supportive of this form of housing. It does provide uh, those opportunities for families to stay together like this, uh, this family here. Um, and we hadn't had any opposition from, from the neighboring properties. So uh, for all of those reasons, I am supportive. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hansen. Yeah, thank you very much. I also uh, support this uh, development uh, variance permit. And I uh, also so, uh, agree with the comments of Councillor Murray and Councillor Back that came before me. Uh, just taking a bit of an overview, uh, the challenge with this particular site for a coach house is that it's neither on a corner lot, uh, nor does it have lane access. And of course, uh, uh, for the most part, we have sought to uh, locate down, uh, coach houses in uh, locations where there's either a corner lot or lane access. Uh, in addition to that, in this particular case, the lot is somewhat steep and uh, the development will require some tree removal. Against this, this is a very large lot, 11,374 uh, square feet. Uh, there's ample parking on the site. And I am confident, I, I have attended at the site and walked around it as best I could. I'm confident that the construction can occur on this site without excessive environmental harm. And I'm also confident that given the slope of the lot, and the position of the main house, uh, that the coach house can be constructed without negative impact on any of the neighbors, either to the north or to the west. 
uh, approval of this development variant uh, permit will allow for the kind of gentle densification, which I uh, have voted in favor of uh, consistently, and it will create a dwelling without any uh, negative community impact. And Mr. Renning said that his daughter would be uh, living in this uh, dwelling and keep, uh, serving uh, to keep a family together in our neighborhood. So I'm happy to support this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councillor Hansen. And I did just want to go back again because Kevin Lee, who had signed up to speak at the item, is here. Um, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to speak. So, um, Kevin, you have three minutes to address Council. And apologies that we missed you the first go around. If you're talking, you're on, we can't hear you. Can I just ask the clerk is, have we? Oh, I, I think I'm on mute. Uh, yeah, you're off. You. You're off now. Welcome, Kevin. You have three minutes to address council. Thank you, Your Worship and Council Members. My name is Kevin Lee from Synthesis Design, the designer of a proposed coach house on 4040A Thornton Highway. We have been retained as a designer coach house so that my client Michael and Susan Running can live with Susan's aging mother on the same property. The proposed mod is 578 square feet, one-story coach house, conformed to all the DNV coach house guidelines, including floor space. Height, site coverage, design, parking, landscaping, and setbacks. The coach house has been sited in front of the principal building for the following reasons. One, the existing house is sited much further towards the rear with a 48.4 front yard setback. The front yard location still confirms the required 25 feet front yard setbacks. It has a similar impact of secondary suite addition in the front of the existing house, except it's detached. The front yard has approximately a foot lower natural grade than the rear yard. Therefore, the front yard location minimizes the visual impact to the surrounding neighbors. This especially respects the neighbor on 4101 Roche Place. Since there's no rear lane and flanking street, the front yard location also allows much easier vehicle access while remaining the existing curb cut. It also minimizes the traffic impact to the principal building, residents, and the neighboring properties. The existing front yard has so many overgrown plants with a poor condition on the slope. The front yard development allows us to improve the boulevard and front yard landscaping with new retaining wall and plants. We have recently completed a coach house, also sited in front of the existing house on 3635 Blue Banana Road for similar reasons. This successful development has improved the neighboring property value and had received many positive comments. At this point, we respectfully request support for this proposal. Sincerely, Kevin Lee, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so moving on to council comments, uh, I have Councillor Forbes up next. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanna congratulate uh, Mr. Lee on such a well-designed uh, coach house. Um, I drove by the property myself. I was pretty sure I knew which what the landscape was in that area because I've walked it before, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't mistaken. And I drove past the property and uh, as the drawing shows in our agenda that uh, it looks like you're looking at the upper part of the second house as you're sort of right in front of it. So it's very well designed. Uh, and so you could tell I'm gonna vote in favor of this. The only thing I just wanna make a mention of as far as trees being taken down, um, there were five trees recommended by the arbor is to be removed. And four of those trees were in poor condition. So there was one tr tree that was recommended to be removed that wasn't in poor condition. And then there was also one other tree that had to be removed in order to do the construction. So there's actually, and it will be replaced. There'll be another tree planted back on. So there's a loss of two trees, but we get one back. And, um, even though it's a front yard coach house uh, and we don't usually do those very often, um, I think this property is well suited and the design is excellent for the landscape there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Forbes, Councillor Beck, uh, Bond, sorry. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor Kern. Uh, I will support this proposal. I think it's a really interesting design. 
Um, and like all of our coach houses, it's not necessarily an increase in the number of dwellings since we only permit two, uh, two dwellings per uh, single uh, detached uh, home, either a basement suite or a, uh, a dwelling outside the home. So um, it's not necessarily an addition uh, of an additional dwelling, um, but I think it's a really interesting concept. One point of curiosity, I think, perhaps for the applicant, if, uh, if you do have the opportunity to answer, or through staff is uh, I noticed that the coach house proposed is actually um, quite small in terms of square footage. Now I'm wondering if that was mostly due to site constraints um, or uh, or um, uh, floor space requirements with the existing home. Uh, I'm just interested to know uh, uh, why the coach house was proposed uh, at the size it was. Thank you. Um, can staff comment on that? Uh, your worship through to Councillor Bond. I actually don't have that information at hand, so I'm not sure whether uh, Mr. Lee is able to respond to that question. Uh, may I speak? Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Hi, thank you, uh, Councillor Bond. Yes, mostly it's because the uh, footprint. Uh, we're trying to make sure all the uh, side yard setback, everything is conforming. And my client has a very uh, modest request for the coach house as well. So we don't need to make it bigger. Uh, and also we don't want to make it two story uh, because that will block uh, too much view for the main house and also gonna uh, have too much visual impact for the neighbors. Okay, great. That's uh, that's great information, and uh, I think this is a this is a great project. It seems like you've met, uh, uh, done your best uh, with a with a really interesting design to meet all the requirements, both of the district, uh, the existing zoning policies, as well as the needs of your clients. So uh, I wish you and uh, the owners of the property and uh, all the family members that are going to enjoy this uh, the best of success with this. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, make a short comment. I think uh, council has covered it already. Um, I'm also happy to approve this. I don't think that the district is quite where we need to be um, yet in terms of water management and some other issues, but I, I think this is a great um, project. And I, I think every time we do one of these um, coach houses is an opportunity to learn. Um, and um, because this is, this is a great option um, and right now it's quite limited, the areas um, that we, that we um, permit them in. And so um, I think it's, we just, we would love Kevin to learn, learn from you and your experience um, and other folks who have built coach houses because we haven't seen a lot of uptake um, on these. And so I think it's important to understand um, some of the challenges, but um, I will go ahead and call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Um, and it, that's unanimous. So that passes. Thank you. Thank you. Just moving on at a lightning pace this evening, Council. So item 8.4, the safe supply of opioids. This is a report brought forward by Councillor Hansen. Councillor Hansen, do you have a would you like to move your? I I, I move the uh, uh, the motion set out in the in the report. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Is there a seconder for Councillor Hansen's motion? I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Murray. Councillor Hansen. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Mayor Curran. This motion derives from my participation uh, now as chair of the North Shore Standing Committee on Substance Abuse. And I'm going to provide some statistical context to opioid deaths in British Columbia. In February 2021, 155 British Columbians died of toxic drug overdoses. Vast majority are fentanyl and carfentanyl toxicities in opioids. That is five and a half persons per day. In 2020, 1,716 British Columbians died 
of toxic illicit drugs. In 2020, 46 persons died on the North Shore Coast Garibaldi of toxic drugs. So far in 2021, the overall rate of death in British Columbia has been five per day. And I would ask uh, all of us and anyone listening to imagine, how would we respond if uh, this number of persons were dying in motor vehicle accidents, were dying due to violence, were dying due to any other category of defective product. To date, 1,495 British Columbians have died due to COVID, less than the number of deaths due to opioid overdoses in the same period of time. And I don't mean to be rhetorical, but it's important that we reflect that each and every death is somebody's child. I, I have two children and uh, I am so grateful that they are alive and not dead uh, due to toxic drug toxicity. Everyone is somebody's sibling. Everyone is somebody's parent and everyone is somebody's friend. Uh, these deaths occur across all ages and all demographics. Uh, it would be a, a fool who would think that their family could be immune uh, from this problem. Every death is somebody's loved one. And every death is a tragedy that reverberates throughout that family, uh, that community, and uh, destroys the lives of the departed, but also leaves a horrible uh, a blot on the lives of those who survived. Uh, uh, my son has two friends that have died of toxic drug toxicity. I think of their parents on Christmas day because it's not going to be a happy day uh, for them. It couldn't possibly be. And the real tragedy is that these deaths are preventable. And I put this out there as an idea. Imagine if alcohol were sold without quality control. Uh, imagine if we continue to have alcohol prohibition. And person, when they took a drink, they had no idea knowing the uh, purity of the beverage. And they could think they're drinking a purity of a certain level, but it turns out it's toxic and they, they die. The death toll would be horrendous. And today we have exactly this comparable situation with opioid overdose deaths. We have prohibition, which is causing a toxic supply and numerous avoidable deaths. This is a public health emergency. And we have tried other strategies to prevent the carnage. We've tried harm reduction, we've tried treatment. We've tried naloxone distribution. Councillor Hansen, the, I'm just going to, um, would you like to just continue? I'll continue. However, the Thank deaths you. continue uh, and the deaths will continue until the laws are changed and we have legalized and a regulated market for opioids. The Canadian death toll since January 2016 due to toxic drugs was 16,360. That is a number, it's a staggering number, and the fact that all of those are preventable deaths, uh, is a, a, and the fact that we tolerate that level of carnage is, in my view, truly shocking. It uh, brings to mind a level of criminal negligence in the administration of our affairs. And in my view, uh, this is a problem that belongs with the federal parliament. They, they, they can address this problem. Uh, and in my view, it's criminally negligent for them not to through a program of legalization and regulation. And as local governments, I believe that uh, we must speak out uh, the motion that I've put forward is just that. It's advocacy by this body on what I consider to be an absolutely pressing issue of public health in, uh, in our jurisdiction. And I urge my fellow councillors uh, to support the motion. 
Thank you, Councillor Hansen. The seconder was Councillor Mary. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So I, I think the, uh, the be it resolved that the Government of Canada declare the overdose crisis a national public health emergency um, is, is absolutely imperative. And, uh, um, you know, when we, we look back in the city of Vancouver um, and certainly the downtown east side, you know, where once that was a, a community um, where, well, many of us at this table frequented, um, we shopped there, uh, there was um, businesses there. Um, now it's a, a place where um, there is a community there, absolutely, there's a community there, um, but one that struggles um, um, and, and they're, they're, they're not keeping their heads above water. Um, you know, we've watched COVID and, and the obviously the response to COVID and, you know, a pandemic is, is uh, uh, obviously a crisis. Um, it's a different kind of crisis than a drug crisis. Um, but, you know, often um, people that are dealing with drug addiction um, are uh, not the priority. And uh, there's a, a series on YouTube right now. It's called the uh, Soft White Underbelly. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a series of interviews um, done by a photographer um, and photojournalist named Mark Leda, um, who lives in LA and New York. And uh, it's a stunning um, series of interviews with people that are um, on the streets for all sorts of reasons. And uh, the, the mental health challenges, the trauma and abuse that they've come from. Um, Every one of those people down on the downtown east side and many of the people that are dealing with um, crisis in regards to Councillor Hansen's motions and opioids, um, many of them um, come from uh, broken homes, uh, places of trauma, places of, ab of abuse, and uh, they all have a story. Um, and uh, I think those stories are integral to us understanding what we need to do and how we need to step up to help them. Because um, we haven't been doing a very good job. We're band-aiding everything, in my opinion. Um, I had a friend, the friend uh, that I've known for, for years who came from a good family and uh, was in a tent last year. Um, I've had um, I've lost one of my closest girlfriends um, from alcohol and drug abuse. And, um, you know, I've watched uh, people that I consider family struggle with addiction uh, for, for many, many years, decades, I will say decades. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I'll tell you a little story in regards to the op opioid, and it was a personal one that I had with my daughter. And, uh, you know, there's the issues of um, street drugs, and then <clears throat> with the opioids, uh, they're, they're prescribed um, generally for pain. And uh, my daughter had a skiing accident and had a plateau fracture. And I went to pick her up at the hospital after they reset it. And uh, I was getting the bags and the crutches and the wheelchair and, and trying to sign her out. Sorry, there's my yapi chihuahua. And, um, and uh, the doctor um, gave me, he said, you know, she's good with Tylenols, um, but I'll give you this prescription and uh, um, you can fill it if, she, if the pain gets worse. And so I shoved it in my purse and got her into the car and went home and uh, got her settled and then later went to pull the prescription out of my purse. And I looked at it and I went, oh, I've never seen a prescription like this before. And uh, it was a triple script. And that's why I'd never seen it because I'd never been given a triple script prescription. And it was for hydromorphone. And I was not, <clears throat> it was not um, indicated to me that it was a prescription for an opioid. Um, Councillor Mary, time's up. Do you want to just keep it going? Sure. Thanks. Um, and uh, my response to that um, prescription was I ripped it up and threw it in the garbage. Um, and um, she was going to manage with Tylenol. And I wasn't going to take that risk um, for my daughter in regards to an opioid. Um, because I do believe that um, addiction runs in families. And um, I do believe there's a predisposition to it. And um, although I don't feel that there is a, a level of addiction in, um, in either of our families um, for my daughter, I wasn't gonna take that chance. And it's amazing that um, young, young people, um, they are 
um, given the responsibility in many cases to make this decision. I know there was a young boy over on the island who lost his life because of um, addiction to prescription drugs. And it was because um, it was prescribed to him and he got to make the decision as to whether or not he wanted to take that medication. And the parents after a certain age are out of it. And that's shocking to me as a parent. Um, my daughter was 16 at the time when she had her ski accident and was not um, able to make a decision in regards to taking a drug with that level of strength. So I think this, um, I thank Councillor Hanson for bringing this forward. I think this discussion, um, you know, uh, it, it needs to be elevated to the very top. Um, this, is, this crisis is not going to get um, better, it's going to get worse. And we need to, um, it's an expensive crisis to fix, very, very expensive. It probably um, it equates to the COVID crisis um, because of the ongoing um, counseling and uh, mental health treatment that will be needed to, um, you know, rid these poor souls of uh, the years of addiction that they've had to face and the, and the issues that they uh, continue to face just to breathe another day. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mary. Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor Curran. I think um, Councillor Hansen and Councillor Mary have, have done a, a great job of um, highlighting the very personal uh, impact that the uh, opioid, uh, the drug poisoning crisis has on, on people uh, of all stripes in our community. And, you know, I think. Um, the call for a safe drug supply is nothing new. It's just been highlighted uh, mostly because of uh, fentanyl and, and the poisoning that has been happening over the past five to 10 years. But, you know, um, Councillor uh, Hansen uh, uh, mentioned a, a movie we, uh, and, uh, and Councillor Muri as well. You know, we can go back to even 20 years ago um, when the first uh, safe injection site in Vancouver was proposed and opened and uh, and the movie um, Fix, the story of Addicted City is almost 20 years old now. And one of the things I think that's uh, important um, that I uh, I remember when I rewatched that movie uh, recently was, um, you know, the activist uh, Anne Livingston, who's been working on the downtown east side and working as a uh, advocate for uh, the rights and uh, safety and the health of, of drug users in, in that neighborhood, um, said that um, with safe supply and with safe injection, this is a harm reduction strategy. And and I'm going to get I'm going to get this quote wrong, but I'm going to paraphrase. And what she said was that um, these types of uh, policies and these types of facilities, what they do in the most subtle way is to let people who are struggling, who are drug users, um, know that the rest of society actually cares and we care that they are alive. Um, and we care that uh, by having a safe supply that there will be a day where they can, they can get better. And, we, and, and doing so, I, I think these types of policies are, are based on evidence, uh, they, they are based in humanity and they're based in compassion. So I, I support Councillor Hansen's motion and, uh, and I hope that uh, the rest of council, it seems like we will support this. So uh, looking for strong action from the federal government on this issue. Thanks, Councillor Bond, Councillor Back. Thank you. Uh... Acting Mayor Curran, um, thanks to everyone for their their comments. I um, agree with everything that's been said, and thanks, Councillor Hansen, for bringing this motion forward. Um, uh, I note that we would be joining some other municipalities. I think uh, the District of West Vancouver is discussing a similar action uh, tonight uh, at their meeting. Um, but I'm I'm fully supportive, um, you know, and realizing that this isn't a downtown East Side problem. This is an everywhere problem. Um, we have people. Um, dying in our community all the time and they're using alone for uh, a lot of the time um and so it really highlights the need for for action in a in a significant way and um so happy to support this um obviously this pandemic has taken thousands of lives um but the opioid crisis continues to do the same and a life is a life and uh as you said councillor hansen everybody is somebody's friend or, or relative and um I think this is this is the right stance to be taking, and um, I'd like to see more communities uh, take it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Back. Councillor Forbes. 
Thank you. Um, I don't often tell personal stories, but um, Councilor Murray has just reminded me of something. When I was taking care of my father when he was dying, one of the drugs he was given was hydromorphine. And I was naive, didn't have a clue. And so I had to look it all up and, and make sure I was giving it to him correctly. And uh, it really took him out of his pain. I knew that. And when I broke my ankle two years ago, um, I got prescribed, when I got home and looked at the prescription, it was hydromorphine. I took two pills. I was supposed to take two pills every four hours. I took two pills and then I started taking Advil and Tylenol. And I just didn't want to take it. I was so terrified myself of, there's no addiction in my family, but I just hear so, so many stories of people that t start taking it for a bad back or pain. I know someone that started taking it for pain in the a back pain and uh, they had a really hard time getting off of it. So it's easy to fall into e even in the legal way. And that's maybe something for discussion somewhere farther down the road. But I agree with Councillor Hansen that the federal government has to get into this and you don't wait for the problem to get bad enough to start doing something about giving support to these people. You get the support there so that when the people need the help, it's already there. So I fully support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Forbes. So um, I am also happy to support this. Um, I, I was pleased to learn a little bit more about um, the organization, um, Mom Stop the Harm, that championed um, some of this work. And so I think it's really important to um, read, and this sort of echoes what, what a lot of, um, what a lot of council was saying, Mom Stop the Harm, calls for an end to the failed war on drugs through evidence-based prevention, treatment, and policy change. We support a harm reduction approach that is both compassionate and non-discriminatory for people who use substances. Our vision is that people who use drugs are not criminalized and that their rights are respected. It sees healthcare as a way to equitably provide for a safe supply of substance and diverse pathways of support for all those affected. It includes support and empowerment of families to use their voices without shame, to share their stories and to advocate for positive change. And I think that that is what we hear over and over again is the stigma um, that people experience. And this is something that is your friend, your neighbor, your, it's, it's in our community. Um, and um, it is a crisis, I absolutely agree. Um, and we need to build communities of care around things like this. And so um, it's definitely something that we have to work towards. I know that I'm not sure what the status is, but the provinces in Canada have a $67 billion class action lawsuit against opioid manufacturers. There was a significant lawsuit um, that happened in the US. So um, there's some funding um, for it, but it, it's absolutely, um, it is a public health crisis. Um, and so I, I believe this needs to be elevated to that level. Um, and then in our own um, things that we can do on our own scale is to, um, you know, work on stigma that we have around um, addiction um, because it affects probably every everyone and everyone um, that we love and that we know. So um, I am happy to support this. So I will call the question. So all those in favor. Um, so that carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. So we're moving on to reports. Do we have any reports from? Yeah, your, your Worship, I, I would just make a, a brief comment about the uh, very successful uh, uh, process that uh, occurred in Lynn Valley. And I just want to report to Council that we had actually 26 staff involved in that to make that happen. So we really got behind it and it was a great event. Thank you, yeah, um, for anyone who was able to attend. So thank you to the community um, and to the staff um, um, and to the volunteers who put together that event in Lynn Canyon um, and, um, and, all, and just all the work um, that the community um, has done out of love. And um, I think it's been very, um, much appreciated and, and will continue. 
Are there any other reports from any members of staff or council? I see Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor Curran. Uh, perhaps on a bit of more of a personal note, um, I was uh, recently challenged uh, on social media by a district resident and uh, local business owner, James Wilson, to participate in the uh, 25 push-ups for 25 days uh, with 25 friends challenge to promote mental health and mental health awareness. And uh, I think I'm on day 10 today. I challenged Councillor back on the first day. Uh, and so I think, uh, especially now with uh, the, the situation and the time that we're in, it's really important for everyone to uh, promote mental health, to reduce stigma around mental health and mental illness. And so if anyone uh, on council or in on staff would like to join in the challenge, uh, I'll, I'll put a soft invite out there uh, before I formally challenge you via social media channels. So. Uh, that was just a, a quick update. So always um, just a reminder to everyone to uh, think about yourself, think about your own mental health and your mental wellness. Uh, check in with your friends. I know it's, uh, and colleagues, it's difficult now because of, uh, because of COVID restrictions, but uh, it's more important now than ever. Thank you, um, Councillor Bond. Yeah, um, I'll start doing my push-ups. Uh, I really appreciate the cause. Um, again, another thing that is a stigma that we need to address. Um, the next speaker is Councillor Murray. Um, thank you. I just wanted to report that I did take part in the Lynn Valley Vigil. Um, my daughter and I drove through um, with, I think, over a thousand other cars um, that were lined up uh, past 27th down Mountain Highway when I left. I was probably in the first group. And uh, so it was a huge, huge outpouring. Everybody was very patient. Um, staff did a, an incredible job and the community volunteers, they were lining the road into the canyon and uh, with candles, it was, uh, it was a very touching tribute. And it was a, uh, a, you know, it was a great way for people to pay their respects to, um, to the, uh, the young woman that lost her life, those that were um, injured in the event and those that witnessed it and the trauma that will um, you know, come from that, it was uh, horrific. But um, today I got an email um, from staff in regards to um, the flowers that have been left at the, at the Lynn Valley uh, Center. And um, uh, I really enjoyed hearing from park staff that they've been taking the flowers, the ones that have um, you know, finished and uh, they're collecting them and they're going to use them. Um, they're gonna compost them and use them as part of the soil um, for a possible planting in the future to, uh, to um, honor the, uh, you know, the victims and uh, maybe a tree planted um, in the village. So I thought that was a really great way to be able to use those flowers because you know, they mean so much for those that are laying them. And uh, it was a, a way for people to go and pay their respects. And so often you wonder what happens to them. And I really um, appreciated staff's creativeness in regards to um, composting them and using them in a future planting. And then um, I guess I would just report that Metro is beginning their discussions in regards to the budget. Um, and it's gonna be a very important budget for councils among the re in the region. Um, to take part in. There's a council council meeting coming up in May and there'll be an introduction to the budget at that meeting. And um, that's all I have to report tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Mary. Councillor Beck. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Mayor Curran. Um, I will start off just by saying my sincere appreciation and thanks as well for the vigil. And I wanted to thank one um, member of the community in particular, and that's Eric Mira of the Lynn Valley Lions. He was really instrumental in leading that effort uh, to organize the vigil in a very short amount of time in just a couple of days. Uh, so him with support from the Lynn Valley, um, he's with the Lynn Valley Lions, but with the support of the Lynn Valley Legion as well, uh, they did a, an incredible job. So thank you. Thank you to them. Um, just wanted to touch on a couple of meetings I had recently. Going back to March 18th, uh, I had my last uh, chamber meeting. Um, and a couple of things that were discussed. One was a recent survey to um, chamber members around some of their ongoing issues that they're dealing with uh, with regards to the pandemic. Um, tra transportation is an issue as it 
as it always is. But in this case, um, it was kind of interesting, um, the point that came up and it was business owners talking about their employees taking transit and not feeling safe taking um, public transit right now. Um, so I thought uh, Mayor Little, that's that's perhaps something he could take back to the Mayor's Council um, because it is an issue. Ridership is still, as we know, way down across the system. And I, I work in that space now um, on the advertising side, but um, I know myself that ridership is, is certainly down. So um, perhaps some, some work needs to be done there by TransLink to get people back on the system. Um, the Chamber also had another uh, roundtable uh, recently with the tourism, recreation and hospitality industry, who are still obviously extremely hard hit by the pandemic. Um, and there's going to be an information report coming to Council soon based on, on that roundtable. So I think there'll be some information in there. And then finally, just wanted to touch on my last uh, meeting with MANOVA, that's the Museum and Archives, as it's now known, MANOVA. Um, planning continues for the opening of the new museum. Um, it's, it is delayed, but um, it's looking as though the official opening weekend will be sometime in um, sort of late summer, early fall, but there will be some um, events leading up to that, which Council will be involved in. We will have a tour down there. Um, the major exhibits are sort of now in place, and uh, it, it looks beautiful. The streetcar, of course, is the main piece as you come into the building. Um, but as I say, there will be some sort of testing events and opportunities for us to go down and, and check it out before the major opening in the fall. That's it for me. Thanks, Councillor Beck. Um, just an update from the library board. Um, we were able to, um, some of the library board members um, and the chair um, were able to, which I guess is also a member, bring um, some treats and some um, flowers to all three of the library branches um, to really thank them. It, it's been hard um, for them even in our different locations because they're their colleagues and it um, hit very close to home. So, um, and, and all of our frontline workers, I think were impacted um, by that tragedy in, in a very profound way. So um, just wanted to recognize all of um, their efforts and um, I continue to work with the Canadian Mental Health Association on the North Shore Peer Assisted Crisis Team response, um, which I think is um, something that is uh, really important um, to be looking at and is, is ongoing. And um, I think that's, those are the updates for me. Any other updates from staff? Jordan, is that your hand from last time? Yeah, yeah okay. Meant. Okay, we've moved adjournment. Oh, Councillor oh, Forbes. Councillor Forbes. I just want to say um, I was involved in all the Lynn Valley um, um, events that took place to uh, recognize the victims and all the support staff. And I just want to say I was there again today, and there, even though staff is. <coughs> wonderful job of sorting through and I want to thank staff for that brilliant idea that they've come up with. Um, there's still lots of flowers there so please everybody please feel free to come and come and look at them if you haven't been there before. Not as many as before but they're still there so please come and look at them. Thank you. Yeah. And just building on that um, staff also um, as much as with all the um, wonderful work that they did. They also um, create, move that to an online, uh, there's an online component as well. So there's still the ability to connect um, to the community that way, um, which I think there's a link from our um, website as well. Um, so yeah, definitely um, grateful for all of staff and community's help um, with that. So Mr. Stewart, did you want to chime in in your forest there? I just want to say you did a great job as acting mayor on very short notice. Good for you. Good job, Megan. Thanks, Good everybody. Job, <laughs> well, thanks yeah, for being here. We can't all work together. <laughs> thanks for taking it easy on me. Um, so I guess since Councillor Murray moved, moved to German, is that... Can we get somebody to I accept it? Second it. Uh, I'll, I'll accept it. I'll second. Councillor Bond is a second. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Did we do it? All those in favor, end? opposed, motion carried. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.